Okay. <coughs> Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we thank thee that we may call upon thy name this day. Thou art our help and our strength, our refuge, our high tower, the rock of our salvation. Apart from thee, we are lost and undone. We rejoice only in that marvelous grace which has been given us before the foundations of the world in Christ Jesus. We thank thee for him, that one who came, the son of thy love, the one who was that son of man who did what the first Adam should not, uh, was not able to do, which he failed to do. We thank thee that <coughs> Christ our Lord has fulfilled all righteousness for us, that he has given himself atonement for our sins, so that in him we now stand before thee as the people of the Lord, reconciled to thee, forgiven, accepted, fully established in the beloved and the hope of everlasting life. And so may our hearts be glad this day. May we give ourselves to the task at hand. May we recognize that uh, our lives are according to thine appointment. And therefore, may we not be complaining, but in all things, uh, looking unto thee in confidence that uh, all things do indeed work together for our good in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so may we be strong in the Lord this day. We look to thee for thy blessing upon thy word. Grant us thy spirit to instruct us out of thy truth. May he indeed direct our thoughts unto that one who is that son of God, that son of man who has overcome the evil one uh, so that he can no longer bring accusations successfully against us. That one who is the, uh, uh, has the power of, of, of death, that he has been overcome by our Savior. We may pray that our thoughts might be <coughs> set upon the triumph of the resurrection and the ascension of uh, Christ the Lord. May our our hearts be lifted up and uh, our affections be set on those things which are where Christ is in the heavenly places and uh, from there he shall appear and we shall see him and we shall be like him. This is our hope. Uh, fan it into bright flame in, within the, each one of our hearts we pray this day for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> we want to <coughs> excuse me, finish up now our discussion this morning of uh, the 70 weeks passage and move on then. <coughs> Um, perhaps in the second hour, I guess, to the uh, Daniel 2 and 7. <coughs> As we move beyond Daniel 9 into those other chapters, our, our particular uh, thesis, if you will, our, our central concern will be, I guess for the rest of the term, uh, actually, on the subject of the eschatological pattern, the, the question of the millennium and, and so on. Within our discussion of the... Uh, uh, the 70 weeks passes, uh, you know, it, the, the, there are eschatological patterns here to be sure, but uh, our, our main uh, polemic, our main critical in, interest here is in, in, in dealing with and disposing of a dispensationalist view uh, as we move beyond this to these other passages in Daniel 2 and 7 and Ezekiel and 38 and 39. Uh, here our main interest will be in, in uh, uh, critiquing any kind of premillennial or postmillennial view of things in, in favor of a biblical amillennial uh, uh, approach to uh, the matter of eschatology. But for the present now, we're still on the 70 weeks uh, uh, passage, and we have pretty well worked through the text of it. Uh, uh, we've emphasized the importance of seeing the relationship of the of the vision of the 70 weeks, the prophecy of Gabriel to the prayer of Daniel. I mean, I, the, the whole relationship is important, especially to establish the starting point of the 70 weeks. We have seen then that the starting point has to be in the very year of Daniel's prayer. In the, prayer the, the date formula in Daniel 9, ver 1 verse 1, pinpoints this in the first year of Cyrus, uh, Darius. It's the year 539, 538. And uh, Daniel... Uh, realizes from the prophecy of Jeremiah 25 and 29 that the time has come for Israel to be restored because the 70 years of Babylonian exile are up. He knows that because uh, Babylon has fallen and, and uh, Persia has replaced them and that was the signal given in uh, Jeremiah 25 and 29 that the, the 70 years of exile were over and yet the other thing Jeremiah predicted, the restoration of God's people, had not yet taken place. So Daniel's, Daniel's concern is that for an immediate fulfillment according to prophecy and promise uh, of uh, the, the restoration. And the whole vision of the 70 weeks is uh, to the effect then that your prayer is already 
uh, underway. The answer to it is already uh, underway. And, uh, and, and yet the, the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks goes beyond that immediate concern of Daniel with the restoration of the, the, the Old Testament <coughs> typological city and, and, and temple uh, to the antitypical realities of Messiah's age. And uh, so he, he, the vision is given in terms of a pattern of 490 years, 70 weeks, 490 years, which we have seen uh, is to be understood in terms of a jubilee pattern. It begins at 539. It can no longer be literal years. It wouldn't get you up to Christ. And uh, so we know that it's uh, symbolic years, and the symbolism has been evident to the to the, the people of God, uh, uh, we've, we've seen even the Jewish interpretation of it uh, un understood this to be a pattern of, of jubilees, of ten jubilees, the tenth jubilee being the ultimate eschatological age. And so the, the 70 weeks are cast in the form of, of a jubilee framework that, uh, uh, that covers the, the whole rest of history down into the consummation with one jubilee period, seven weeks set aside, for the uh, for restoration of the Old Testament order, as Daniel uh, was praying, uh, but with ten jubilees set aside, with a climactic 70th week uh, in there, uh, to fulfill the ultimate purposes, which had been spelled out already in in uh, the first uh, verse of the vision, verse 24, in that sixfold uh, statement of the six <coughs> works of creation, as it were, that we're going to lead up to the, the Sabbath consummation, and included uh, among which was the thought of making atonement for sin and bringing in everlasting righteousness, and uh, uh, the third and the fourth purposes, and uh, especially the sixth purpose, uh, which was to, to anoint the Holy of Holies, which describes the, uh, the, the final <coughs> achievement of God's ultimate uh, purpose in creation from the beginning, which was to establish and perfect and to consummate the, the the uh, cosmic people uh, uh, temple of God anointed with uh, the, the spirit and so that's the, the, the overview of things that we have there and uh, with the uh, emphasis then especially on the 70th week which is described then in, in, in half of it is half of the prophecy you see verses 26 and 27 are devoted to this 70th week the messianic week and as we, we set the thing up it is the it is the Messiah is cut off, karat, and, and the, thus he uh, establishes uh, the, the new covenant. And uh, so the, the cross is the starting point of, of the new covenant. It's the starting point of the 70th week. Verse 24. That's, that's verse 26a. 26a. Which, which uh, says that uh, after the 69th week, so we've had the description of weeks 1 through 69 divided into 7 plus 62, uh, uh, and uh, the, that has been completed. Now after, after then the 69th week, which is to say in the 70th week, uh, starting the 70th week, Messiah is, is cut off. So 26a, all right, and uh, verses 26 and 27, we were trying to, indicate how important it was uh, for the exegesis to understand the, the parallel structure of, of these two verses, each divided into A, B, C, A, B, C, with uh, A dealing with the new covenant, and B and C with the old covenant, A dealing with the, the concept of the fullness, the fulfillment, uh, B and uh, C uh, with the, the fall of Israel. And uh, A, as we just said, after the 69 weeks, at the beginning of the 70th week, Messiah is cut off, 26a. 27a, rounding out the thought uh, that not only uh, is the, the, the covenant ratified uh, at the beginning of the 70th week, but by the end of the week, in the course of the one week is the formula in 27a, in the course of that one final week, by the time it's over, huh, what would have uh, happened is a uh, hig hig beer. Not, not just karat, cut the covenant, but higbir, and that's what we want to uh, focus on a little more fully here, he will completely fulfill the terms of, of the covenant. So 26a and 27a, uh, we uh, see, emphasize the new covenant after that. Then it goes back and, and picks up on the typological situation. Yes, Daniel, 
your prayer will be answered already in the in the first jubilee period uh, starting from 539 uh, uh, from the origin of the 70 weeks in that first jubilee period daniel's immediate prayer would be answered but by the time we come then to the end of the 62 more weeks and by the time we come up to christ that old covenant community although restored has now become apostate once again terribly uh, so and uh, Therefore, judgment is now called for. And verses uh, 26 B and C and 27 B and C focus on, on this event. The, the final destruction of this old covenant, this mosaic second level national election typological situation, which was a covenant of works and which fails and 70 AD is the end of it. And this is the story of it, huh? <laughs> Fall and full is nothing new. This is what we've seen as the pattern of things, the emphasis the, all, all over the prophets, wherever we go. The, these are the two uh, themes they, they keep re reciting. Uh, there was underneath the, uh, the covenant of grace, and therefore uh, uh, we have 26a and 27a telling us that. Yeah. Uh, although in, in, as a piece of literature, uh, we end with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., Within the message there, uh, it has already been established that that is not the, the final word on the story. This new covenant has been established, and and it will be uh, will be uh, consummated. So this is the the way things uh, shape up. And twenty uh, twenty six b and twenty seven b then begin to describe. Uh, this event of 70 AD, turning to our text once again, maybe just quickly looking at that, 26b, this, as for the city and the sanctuary, the army of the coming prince, Yashit, will destroy it. And uh, now it's not only the thought, but even some of the, 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 the sounds are, are, are the same, uh, underscoring the point I'm making that there's a parallelism here between between 26b and 27b. Just, just, just listen to the sound of it again. Ha'ir ha kodesh yashit. That's 26b. And then in 27b, and in the midst of the week, then it says yashit. So you have uh, yashit, then you have yashit. The, the the echo of the same sound even in 27b, underscoring the the sameness of the message. And uh, 26b clearly has to do with the 70 AD, the coming of of the armies, which, you know, on the scene were the Roman armies, but which according to the text are Messiah's armies, and we, we looked at the parallel, uh, the parables in Matthew 21 and 22 and saw a virtual exegesis of this passage, and especially in Matthew 22, verse 7, where it says that, that the king will send his army and he will destroy that city, and so on, uh, the virtual interpretation of uh, 26b by our Lord in that parable, and, and uh, telling us that the fulfillment then is... Uh, to the work of Messiah Christ himself, which he, he accomplished, of course, in 70 AD. And then parallel to that, 27b, when it says that in the midst of, all right? So we know that this is in the midst of the, the 70th week, and that sets up this division into three and a half and three and a half years uh, in, in, in the midst of that uh, 70th uh, week, uh, which began with Messiah's being uh, cut off, uh, something happens which results in the cutting off of, of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, so it says in the midst of the seventh, uh, uh, in the midst of the, that week, the sacrifice and oblation will cease. And because of the parallelism, then we understand that this cutting off of sacrifice and oblation, 27b, is not referring to what Christ does as a priest, that he fulfills uh, the ultimate antitypical sacrifice. No, it's referring to what he does as a king. Hmm? Yeah, who, who sends his armies, 26b, he sends his armies to destroy the city, and by destroying the city and the temple, of course, he, he terminates a sacrifice and oblation, as it is spelled out for us then in 27b. And then 26c and 27c uh, just show the, the, the ultimate finality of that judgment in 7080. That is the end of the old order. It's termination. It's it's uh, completely being done away with, and the language is just piled up for, uh, one on top of the other term in order to, to say this. And so 
uh, 26 C says, its end is with a flood, unto the end, war, that which is determined to show me most is desolation, you know, solid plot of, of 70 AD uh, as the final end of the old order, which then is echoed in in the somewhat more difficult uh, language of 27 C, but with the parallelism be, before our eyes, that uh, 27 C and 26 C belong together, why then readily 27 C falls into place, the proper interpretation of it. And uh, if you just look once again at uh, not just the similarity of thought, but the, the repetition of terminology, even within 26 C and 27 C, you'll, you'll see that the, the pattern I'm talking about is indeed uh, valid. 26 C uh, has the language of of, uh, of the, the end and uh, Kate's and, and especially the thought of desolations are determined. The, the, the final phrase in 26 uh, C and if you uh, look at the final clause in 27 C once again you see that uh, the participle of that verb to be determined and once again you, you have the root shamam in, in the, the thought of that which is desolate and uh, and uh, <coughs> all right so 27c then we interpret it uh, as uh, in indicating that uh, uh, Messiah becomes the Mishomame he becomes the desolator of Jerusalem uh, in, in, in all of this Messiah is, is the subject he was the subject of course in, as the one who ratifies the new covenant and fulfills its terms. He is the Mashiach Nagid who has been introduced from the beginning and thereafter sometimes called Mashiach, other times called Nagid, uh, but it's Messiah, Messiah, Messiah all the way through. He is the subject of all that's going on, whether in terms of the blessings of the new covenant or in terms of the vengeance uh, on the Old Testament order. So in 27c, when we read about a Mishomame figure, polio form from Shamam, which means to make something else desolate. We should have no hesitation. No one else has been mentioned uh, all the way through here except Mashiach and <coughs> Nagid, and so he definitely is the one. And it was his army. It was his army uh, that destroyed the, the city. And so obviously he is the desolator of, of, uh, of the city. And so upon uh, the extremity, the kanaf of shikutsim, of abominations, that is to say, uh, here is this order which had been restored in, uh, in one jubilee, the Old Testament order, which however as we said by the time you come to the end of the 69th uh, week has become a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer uh, and uh, uh, a place where the, the leaders are ready to repudiate and reject uh, that that son whom the Lord of the Vineyard sends uh, to collect his uh, dues uh, and, and do season uh, that they've committed the, the ultimate uh, apostasy and there is no remedy the same kind of language that was used in the Old Testament when uh, Israel was ripe for Babylonian exile there was no more remedy they had repudiated the whole lawsuit process that in, in a even more final sense is uh, the case now in 70 AD they have repudiated we have no king but Caesar Christ is, is repudiated, and uh, so the, the due results of, of that, uh, even after one further generation of overlap is given to them, okay? So the old covenant overlaps the new by a generation, but even after a, a, another generation of the apostolic age is, is given as an opportunity for the old covenant uh, community, of course, they're, they're, in, in effect, the lawsuit is all over. They are doomed, and this one more generation just serves the purpose of, of giving the remnant, the elect within the old order, the opportunity to respond to the gospel. And so there is that overlap uh, period, but uh, then when that final opportunity is, is closed, then destruction descends. Mishomame, Christ is the desolator who comes down upon this abomination of desolation. It is already an abomination of desolation. It isn't that someone from the outside, like the Romans or a anyone else, must introduce some pagan abomination into the temple to make it so. The temple itself is, is the abomination already and is ready for destruction, and that destruction comes from 
Christ, the, the missional name, and unto the kala, unto the complete end, that which has been determined in the decrees of heaven from uh, the, the outset, uh, this is the uh, decree, the decree uh, that uh, we read about at the beginning of this is uh, the, the yatsa davar, the, the, the word, the decree that has go already gone forth for the 70 weeks to begin. Uh, that decree came from the, the heavenly uh, court, but from that heavenly court, uh, there is also the decree that goes forth with respect to the whole Old Testament community that it should be destroyed. And, and the decree of heaven is fulfilled. That which has been determined in, in the heavenly uh, council and court will be poured for al Shomim. And we try to emphasize the point then that the, the difference between Mishomim and Shomim and, and to avoid the, the misinterpretations, the bad translations that you have as in the NIV that so mistranslate this that you get the impression at the end uh, that the Shomim is the same as the Mishomim, uh, uh, which, uh, for example, the dispensationalists interpret both of them and uh, of Antichrist. Uh, that, that in the case of the Mishomim, the desolating the temple, uh, their particular version of that is that in the mixed, mid midst of the week that uh, they regard as the beginning then of uh, the, uh, as the 70th week, uh, uh, Satan or Antichrist uh, uh, who breaks a covenant that he has made uh, with the, the Jews and, and, and desolates them during the last three and a half weeks of, of their 70th, uh, uh, 70th week. <coughs> Not the last three and a half years of their 70th week. And, uh, and so they think that at the end of the prophecy, there is the thought that he himself will be made desolate, that the Antichrist, having uh, desolated the, the, the community with which he had made a false uh, covenant in faith, that he in turn himself will be desolate. Now that uh, overlooks the whole difference between Mishomame and Shomame. Shomame at the end is not to make someone else desolate, but to be desolate. And there's no question about what is the desolate thing. The desolate thing is not Antichrist, it's Jerusalem and the temple. At the end of 26C, that which is determined is Shomemot. This term Shomemot is definitely referring uh, to the uh, Jerusalem destroyed in 70 AD. That's what it is in 26C. That's therefore what it must be in 27C just as well. And uh, so the, uh, the Shomame at the end is that desolate place. And so upon uh, uh, the, the extremity of abominations, Messiah, the Mishomim, the desolator, uh, uh, comes with his judgment, and unto the full end, Kala, that which has been determined, uh, will indeed pour out upon the city which is Shomim, because Christ has made it uh, so. And uh, so that is the picture that we get there. Now, uh, it, coming back then from that to uh, 27a, and to, to the picture of the new covenant, and because after all, in, in terms of this prophecy, the fall of Jerusalem is not the last word. The fall of uh, Jerusalem comes in after the new covenant has been established here, and does uh, not break the ongoing history of the new covenant, which of course then consummates for a generation. The church has been uh, the, the church sort of. In, involved still with the Old Covenant order, but from 70 A.D. on, there is no Old Testament order. And so from here to the consummation, through that last three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, as it's variously called, through that period, henceforth, the church is the church disengaged from the Old Testament order, the church abroad in, 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 in uh, uh, the world. And in the course then, of that 70th week, and by the end of the, the second half of it in particular, when we have come to the final jubilee, the end of the 10th jubilee, and the introduction of the age of the consummation, by that point, in the course of that one week, big beer, big beer, Mashiach Nagid, will not only have uh, done that which is called karat with respect to the new covenant, but he will also have done that which is denoted by the verb gaver in the hifiel form, which does not mean to, to cut, to ratify a covenant, but given that there's already a covenant on the scene, to honor it, to bring its terms uh, uh, to, uh, to their ultimate fulfillment. And that, of course, is precisely what you'd expect to be the, the final word on uh, this subject, which is introduced by a six-fold purpose, pointing to the, the final, final jubilee. Now, just to uh, underscore and hope 
hopefully hopefully clarify a little bit uh, that uh, term uh, gaver that we're emphasizing the verb hig hig beer. Uh, and uh, of course here again over against dispensationalism uh, they just treat hig beer as if it were karat uh, uh, the making of a covenant and, and the subject as we said they don't regard as messiah but as antichrist and so 27c becomes for them a statement that antichrist will make a covenant <laughs> you know that's their handling of hig beer which then in the midst of the week he breaks now that's total opposite the, the polar opposite of what the text says the text is speaking not about Antichrist is speaking about Christ, and it is speaking not about a covenant uh, that, that proves a, a failure in the midst of the week, but it's about a covenant that comes to wonderful, perfect, uh, consummate uh, uh, fulfillment. So to uh, try to just to develop that thought, which I, I did it in that article, The Covenant of the 70th Week, which we mentioned uh, previously, and, then, and uh, bear with me, I think I'll just read a bit from that, and at the same time it may serve... Uh, to round out our whole uh, positive discussion of the 70 weeks. We'll just come back for a moment and, and criticize Kyle's view and maybe sum up our, our, our critique of dispensationalism. But in, in terms of a positive exposition uh, of the thing, um, as we come to the closing verses of Gabriel's prophecy, both the form and content of Daniel 9 have prepared us for a decisive final word about the messianic consummation of God's covenant with Israel in the last of the 70 weeks. When, therefore, we find a covenant mentioned in verse 27, there should be no doubt as to its identity. Uh, the whole context speaks against the supposition that an altogether different covenant than the divine covenant, which is the central theme throughout Daniel, including Daniel's prayer, and therefore, obviously, in the prophecy which answers it, uh, it's that covenant of grace uh, that has been the subject all the way through. That's the the, the, the berith that's in you in uh, the, uh, the the climax here. Nor need there be any question as to the identity of the one who makes this covenant to prevail. It is, of course, the Mashiach Nagi, the anointed prince whose presence was said to mark the beginning of the 70th week. There's an interesting link between the Messiah and the covenant in verse 26, as we've seen. His death is there described by the verb karat, used for ratifying covenants and so on. The statement about the covenant in verse 27 is then in clear continuity with the covenantal allusion in, in, in verse 26. Gabriel here assures Daniel that the cutting off of the anointed one, verse 26, would not mean the failure of his mission, but on the contrary, the beginning of its accomplishment. In the course of the one week, he will make the covenant, and we'll use a, a translation, prevail, uh, for Higbeer, he will make the covenant prevail in behalf of the many, uh, Isianic language, the one and the many, the servant of the Lord uh, doing it uh, for the many. It was by his death for the iniquity of his people that the Lord's anointed servant ratified the new covenant in which uh, then God's uh, that underlying level of the covenant of grace and the old covenant uh, found its uh, continuity and fulfillment. In verse 27, the petition of Daniel's prayer receives its most direct response. Precisely here, at, at the end, uh, the, uh, the, the prophetic assurance of a divine confirmation of the covenant is explicitly stated. The fact should not be ignored that in this crucial statement, the verb employed is not the, the verb for the making of a covenant, uh, which is karat, uh, uh, and, uh, which was used in 26a to intimate that according to God's redemptive counsel, the slaying of the Messiah was the ratificatory sacrifice of the new covenant. In verse 27, already in verse 26b, the prophecy proceeds from the ratification of God's covenant to the powerful and ultimate execution of the sanctions of the covenant, both blessing and, and curse. Now, this idea of making the terms of the covenant to be fulfilled uh, it might have been expressed by the verb kum in the hyphial form, hey kim, hyphial form of uh, kum, which would mean to cause it to stand, to fulfill it. Daniel used that verb, the hyphial of kum, hey kim, uh, in his prayer, acknowledging that though through the judgment of the exile, God had carried out his words against Israel. So the, the judgment was a making to stand the, the uh, curse sanction of the covenant, the words of the oath curse of the covenant. 
Jeremiah used Hakeem in his 70 years prophecy to say that God would carry out his promise of covenant blessing. At the end of the 70 years, God will make to stand that good word which he had prophesied of restoration. When Gabriel then tells Daniel that God will bring the blessing sanctions of the ancient covenant to realization in dimensions far beyond Daniel's immediate uh, level of concern, uh, he, Gabriel, expresses the idea of fulfillment by an equivalent of Hakeem an even more emphatic verb, the one in our text here, higbir, to make strong, to cause, to uh, prevail. Now, this is uh, n- n- not used all that often, and so uh, the, the usages uh, that we have are, uh, must be noted. The force of this verb higbir excludes the notion that the covenant referred to here in Daniel 9.27 is some arrangement imposed by a future antichrist, whether conceived of within dispensational or other eschatological framework. According to these futurist reconstructions, antichrist enters into some pact at the beginning of the 70th week, and then what he succeeds doing in the course of that week is to break his covenant, not to do what higbir says. Such a situation must be insisted would be diametrical opposite of what verse 27 describes. The evidence on the usage of Higbeer indicates that verse 27 has in view the enforcing of the terms of a covenant previously granted. If so, it can only refer to God's faithful fulfillment of the covenant he has given to his people of their ultimate uh, salvation in Christ. Now elsewhere in the Old Testament, the hiphial form of this verb, gaver, mm -hmm, uh, appears only in Psalm 12 verse 5 where it means to be strong, to prevail. But uh, among the Qumran texts, there are the uh, texts known as the Qumran Thanksgiving hymns. And uh, the, this verb is also found in one of those uh, Thanksgiving uh, hymns, the author of which uses uh, the verb in, in his hymn to express what idea? Well, the idea that through him, through the psalmist, and through his persecutions, God demonstrates his power, God prevails. That's what Higbeer is all about, demonstration of power prevailing, fulfilling. This idea then is expounded in the immediate context of that psalm where the psalmist offers praise that by the divine faithfulness he uses the word hesed. So in the context of higbir and, and giving it its uh, proper kind of connotation, uh, we have this term hesed which has to do uh, you know, so much with the idea of covenant faithfulness, uh, carrying out the terms of a covenant. So the psalmist rejoices that by God's Chesed, faithfulness, uh, he, the psalmist, has been enabled to hold firmly to God's covenant while his mighty persecutors have been judged. Here, then, is a covenantal passage uh, in which uh, the Hiphiel of Gavar denotes God's faithful, powerful enforcement of the blessings and curses of, of his covenant, blessings for his people, curses on their enemies. Now, certain biblical passages uh, where gavar is used in the cow stem, we said it's used in the hiphiel only in that one passage, but it's used elsewhere in the cow stem, and certain of those are, are distinctly covenantal and illuminate the, the force of this verb in Daniel 9.27. For example, in Psalm 103.11, where the language of the covenant formulary is especially conspicuous, <coughs> and again in Psalm 117, verse 2, the subject of Gavar is once again that word chesed, God's faithfulness. Uh, the idea of the faithfulness comes to expression in, in the faithful execution of fulfilling of things. So this uh, now, a virtual synonym of, of barit, covenant, uh, and more particularly chesed is the covenant faithfulness by which God maintains and fulfills the order of the attitude he has established. It was to the covenant-keeping and chesed of God that Daniel had appealed the start of his prayer. This terminology uh, in, informs the prayer of Daniel, or he appeals to God to be a God of chesed, uh, who will pig beard, who will carry out the, his uh, promises. Uh, so setting the theme to which both his prayer and Gabriel's response closely adhered. And in both of those Psalms, 103 and 117, the idea of God's making the covenant blessing prevail, gavar, comes to parallel expression in the declaration that some element of the covenant, like righteousness or truth, will endure unto children's children or will be everlasting. So the ideas are all in terms of covenant fulfillment, permanence, and the, the exact opposite of some antichrist making a covenant and then uh, <coughs> breaking it in the, in the middle of, of the week. Likewise, in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, the statement in the closing verse that the covenant will be made to prevail answers to 
you remember the, the original sixfold purposes, and among them, uh, he, Messiah will make atonement for sin, and he will bring in everlasting righteousness. It's the permanence of the, the consummations, the finality of his work that was in the purposes. And now we have in the, the close of the, the song uh, of the prophecy uh, that which answers uh, to the, the the purpose of it. The fulfillment is also one that in, involves uh, the everlasting uh, character of the of the blessings. The evidence of the usage of Gavar thus refutes conclusively those interpretations of Daniel 9.27 that would find a reference to the mere initiation of a covenant relation, indeed of a covenant that is supposed to fall through perfidy. And uh, for with reference to uh, the, the covenants, uh, the Gavar consistently has to do with the ideas of covenant fidelity, covenant perpetuity. Now, one further line uh, of evidence uh, to illustrate and, and confirm uh, this meaning uh, of Higbeer in Daniel 9.27 um, has to do uh, with, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see with I Isaiah chapters 9 and 10. Turns out that the, 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 the source, of a lot of the language and the thought of uh, Daniel 9.27 is found back in Isaiah verses nine, uh, chapters 9 and 10. And to get at the, this uh, now, uh, we, uh, we note the, the noun uh, gibor, the, the kind of action denoted by the verb gaver hmm, is performed by a gibor, which if you saw it in, in your text, you would translate a, a hero, a warrior, uh, a mighty one. This term gibor is used, in fact, as an epithet of God himself in the, you get that covenant preamble type of formula where God is being described uh, and uh, that appears in shorter and longer forms in the Deuteronomic Treaty and in covenant renewal prayers so like the one in Daniel 9, the Todah Confession Prayer. Uh, it's, it's a formula then that describes God as the great, the Gibor, Ha-Gibor. God is described as, as the Gibor figure and then also as the fearful God, Ail, as the one who keeps Berit and Chesed to a thousand generations and recompenses the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. So the noun, Gibor, which derives from the verb we're talking about, Gavar, is used as a description of God precisely in those covenantal contexts in which uh, God is described as the one who fulfills and who keeps the Berit uh, to a thousand generations. Especially significant for the meaning of Higbeer in Daniel 9.27 is the use of that noun gibor in Isaiah 9 and 10. Now you're familiar with uh, that messianic uh, context in Isaiah 9 and 10, uh, where the, that title gibor, not just used for God in general, but it's used for the Messiah. Isaiah identified the Messiah, the son of David, as El gibor, uh, the, the God, uh, the, the mighty uh, hero one, the, the mighty God of the covenant formula, by declaring his name, Isaiah 9, 5 in the Hebrew text, uh, Isaiah de describes Messiah as El Gibor. And then in chapter 10, in Isaiah 10, this messianic figure, El Gibor, is mentioned once again by that title. And in the very passage, in fact, from which Daniel 9, 27 derives its thought and its wording alike. So uh, you, at your leisure, would be wanting to look at Isaiah 10 and especially verses 21 through 23. And uh, if you would read that to yourself aloud and, and, and you would read the Daniel the 9 aloud, you would see the, the, the repetition of the vocabulary from the, the both places. I just try to suggest something of it by reading quickly through this. <coughs> Daniel 9, 26b, 27 echoes Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, oh, excuse me, Isaiah spoke there. Isaiah spoke there of God's mighty messianic fulfillment of covenant blessing and curse. He said that a remnant of Jacob would return unto El Gibor, but in an overflooding, the word is Shotep, we had Shetep in Daniel 9, in an overflooding judicial righteousness, the annihilation, Kala, same word as in Daniel 9, that was determined, Nifal form of Harush, same one as in the, twice appears in, in Daniel 9, that which was determined would befall the land. Daniel 9, 26-27 echoes Isaiah's prophecy. The covenant would be made to prevail, Higbeer, 
as a blessing for the many who are faithful, but as a curse in the form of the determined annihilation, all this vocabulary uh, repeated. The unmistakable dependence of Daniel 9.27 on Isaiah 10.21 following points directly to the Eil Gibor of Isaiah 10 verse 21 as the inspiration for the Higbir action of Daniel 9.27. He is the Gibor who, who acts like a Gibor as a mighty one who can make to prevail his, his covenant. Uh, this confirms the conclusion that the subject of Higbir then in Daniel 9.27 is not Antichrist or any other than the anointed one whose name is El Gibor. He is the, the one who performs Gavar type actions. And that the object of Higbir, the covenant made to prevail, is indeed the redemptive covenant sealed by the blood of Christ. So by way of conclusion, then Daniel had prayed for the restoration of the Jerusalem temple, the paramount sacramental symbol of Israel's covenant relation to Yahweh. The prophecy of the 70 weeks assured him that his prayer would begin to be answered at once and that the restoration of the covenant community would be completed in what is portrayed as a jubilee period. Then the prophecy went on to disclose the ultimate unfolding of the covenant and the paradoxical prospects that lay in store for the temple at a later time. After being restored, the Jerusalem temple would again be made a den of abomination, evoking another and final desolation. Israel's Lord would pour out on the rebellious vassal nation the full vengeance of his broken covenant. But though the curse of the Mosaic covenant would be executed to the uttermost on the one select national uh, Israel, uh, the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant underlying that works covenant uh, would be secured for the many who were the individual elect and who were the true Israel. Before the curse terminated the old Mosaic order, Messiah would institute the new covenant order. Uh, and uh, before the Jerusalem temple was leveled, the foundations of the everlasting temple of the spirit, which is Christ and his church would be laid. This new anti-typical restoration of God's temple would be the achievement of what is portrayed then as 10 Jubilee periods. And uh, you know, I think I can stop the reading uh, of this review of it uh, at that point. So Mashiach Nagi then is uh, the one who, who performs all of this action. Well, along the way then we've been uh, criticizing uh, uh, other views uh, and uh, one of them uh, was the um, understanding of of the punctuation in, in uh, uh, Daniel 9.25 by Kyle, which uh, led him to say that there are, from the starting point there, he, he agrees it's, uh, you know, where it should be in the first year of Cyrus. Uh, but, but he so punctuates uh, verse uh, 25 that he says, there are, are seven weeks uh, up, up to Christ, and then uh, the next 62, 8 through 69 would be after Christ and would refer to the church age, leading to the 70th week, <coughs> uh, just the, the end of the church age. On our view, it's, it's the whole church age. Huh? I'm beginning to end on his view. It's just a, a, a crisis at, at, at the end, the Antichrist crisis at the, the end of, of uh, the church age. And uh, so he is obliged to um, make the main punctuation point uh, in, in the middle there. Uh, in, well, let's look at the text in verse uh, 25. <coughs> Where it speaks about from there is, yeah, from the going forth of the decree, which Daniel has already been told, it's already gone forth. So from the going forth of the decree to restore and to uh, uh, our, to, to, well, the two verbs together have the force of, uh, of re restore, shuv and bana, uh, to, to restore Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, uh, the, there are uh, seven weeks. And that's where he puts his major uh, punctuation. And then the rest of the, the verse uh, would be referring to something beyond him. And... 60 and two weeks, which he associates then with the rest of the verse, which says, uh, and uh, it will be uh, restored, street and moat, uh, in the distress of the times, and so on. So a decree goes forth uh, to initiate the, the, this, the restoration, and nothing more than is said 
about this whole period according to his view because he takes that second half of the verse to be referring to the 62 weeks which he identifies with the church age and so the restoration which is decreed back here and begins these seven weeks has nothing to answer to it and, and when it uses again the same two verbs in the second part of the, the verse it, it's uh, not referring to that but it's referring uh, to the, the, the anti-typical thing <coughs> at the, the end so the, that in itself that disjointing that tearing apart of what the text is obviously concerned to, to unite together is one, one, one problem with this uh, view uh, but then the, the, uh, a couple of other things just to note quickly if the language then about what's going on here is uh, understood to refer to the, the church, uh, we have some real problems. It's in the 70th week, especially what is said about the 70th week. It's uh, Messiah is cut off, and that launches the 70 weeks. Well, that's all right. We, we can understand Messiah being cut off on the cross. Uh, we know the purpose of that. Uh, Messiah is being cut off, but once he has thus ratified the covenant and after he has been exalted on high he's been rewarded for his obedience he's uh, experienced the resurrection the ascension and, and he's at the right hand of the majesty on high then to say that at some future point whether late in the church age or wherever that at any point after that Messiah is cut off uh, the, no the, the, this is uh, just bad theology it's not uh, true to what the, the scriptures teach us about Christ. He has won the victory. His humiliation is, is over. And he is in his state of exaltation. All his enemies, one by one, being put under his feet until at last the last death itself. Uh, there's no place in, in, in the biblical view of, of the exalted Christ where that kind of language uh, could apply to him, uh, you know, again after the, the, the cross. But on Kyle's view, uh, that's the way you'd have to take it that in some sense now, Christ is cut off, uh, that his authority, that his power is, is, is uh, diminished, it, it won't do. So, And then the language, the language that is used uh, in these uh, closing verses concerning the, the 70th week, and, and which we've uh, applied as, as our Lord himself uh, does also, when, when he interprets uh, in the eschatological discourse, he interprets for us Daniel uh, 9 and 27 about the abomination of desolation. Jesus interprets uh, this language of, of the ultimate curse and desolation of the, the fall of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the end of the old works order, and that's understandable. But on Kyle's view, all of this uh, language would be applying to the, the church, that the church is the thing uh, that is going to become an abomination of desolations and uh, that that will be uh, destroyed and so on. And uh, this does not fit with the biblical eschatology. Yes, there is a crisis. So, so in the, uh, the formal idea that there will be a crisis uh, of, of opposition to the church at the end of the uh, church age is one of the, the things that we want to note as we try to develop uh, from here on out the, the, the pattern of eschatology. That's a significant thing, that, that one crisis that, that brings on uh, the parousia. But to, to say that the church, and in particular then you're thinking of the, the true people of, of God who are going to be suffering uh, whatever is predicted for, of uh, that Antichrist crisis, uh, to say that, that the true church is going to become this total uh, accursed abomination uh, that, that uh, must be made uh, desolate, no, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the, the church. In individual uh, unbelievers who, who don't properly own the covenant will be cut off from it, but uh, the church as the, the institution of, of God's covenant uh, will not be terminated the way the old covenant Israel uh, was terminated. The old order was terminated, the church will be consummated. And so this language that is used in Daniel 9, 26 and 27 concerning what will happen in the 70th week is altogether appropriate for 70 AD, not at all appropriate uh, for, for the experience of the church. And so that view of, of, of Kyle has such major problems associated with it. Well then, as for dispensationalism, we've, uh, you know, along the way, 
made the points then that we want to make uh, what is problematic here. If you're criticizing dispensationalism, of course, you want to start with just an analysis of, of uh, their view, view of the Abrahamic covenant promises and uh, that whole structure of things. But uh, insofar as uh, they appeal distinctively to uh, this passage, uh, then there are, are, are special features of it that we've seen are, are problematic right from the starting point. Uh, they simply are not able to do any kind of justice to the to the big mass of obvious evidence there is that the starting point of the of the prophecy of the 70 weeks is 539 and they have to make it 445 because of, of their of their just assumption of literalism as, as the, 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 the hermeneutic that must be uh, followed. And instead of gathering their hermeneutic from the biblical evidence, they come with this view and impose it on the biblical evidence and, and, and thus warp, uh, make themselves deaf to the biblical evidence in the process. So uh, the passage simply is, is not one which uh, is, is literal. It's, it's, it's symbolic. And uh, moreover, you, you, even when they try to to make things literal by, by starting at 445 in order to get up to the cross. As a matter of fact, they don't really get up to the cross, they get up to the triumphal entry. And moreover, they, even if they could say they are getting up to the cross, uh, literally, they are not getting up to 70 AD, literally. They have to jump over that whole thing and they pick up the 70 and week down in the future. And, and yet, Jesus interprets the uh, the passage as involving 70 A.D. A literalist view would have to get you up literally to 70 A.D., and, and their view doesn't. And by the way, uh, that of others who, who attempt to use uh, Daniel 9 in uh, chronological reconstructions of things. Um, uh, Camping, you know, Harold Camping, we, uh, who was setting dates for the second coming and everything on the basis of... of literal interpretations of biblical uh, chronologies. Uh, Jim Jordan, the theonomist, who is also trying to do uh, something similar to that, that they, that they are all trying to, to work with this. And, and you're, obviously, if you're going to say that the Bible provides you with a chronology, that things are right up uh, here into the uh, New Testament that come out, literally, you're going to have to deal with this passage, and they recognize it, and yet they all flounder and flop around when they come to this point. They, they try to get, get things to come out up to the cross, and then they, uh, they, they say, well, there's a gap then. Uh, I think that's what Jordan does. There's a gap uh, that, that somehow is uh, between the cross and 70 AD. He's trying to, you know, <laughs> that's just an admission of defeat. And, and camping, although he, and, and camping, although he uh, has been trying to work it all out with a literal hermeneutic, now switches his hermeneutic and, and says it's symbolic from from here on. So uh, th this is uh, the the thing that they aren't doing justice to. But 70 A.D. is uh, <coughs> part of the uh, that 70 weeks uh, prophecy. Well, dispensationalists flounder on that, and and as we pointed out, as a matter of fact, on their scheme. When we come to the end of the 69 weeks at the, well, at the triumphal entry, huh? at the triumphal entry just before the cross, uh, the, the clock stops ticking and the parenthesis kicks in. So the 70th week doesn't include anything after the, uh, after the triumphal entry, and therefore it doesn't include the cross and it doesn't include 70 AD. Because when their clock stops ticking again, it's at the end of this parenthesis. The church is out of the world uh, completely. And uh, what it amounts to, therefore, is that the two main things that are focused on and as part of the 70 weeks, the work of Christ on the cross and uh, the destruction of the old order in 70 AD, those two components of the 70th week don't belong to the 70th week at all on a dispensationalist scheme. They fall in a hole between the end of the 69th and the beginning of the 70th week. They do not belong to the 70th week, and that simply is a is an impossible thing to accept if you, if you read uh, the, the text here. The whole monstrosity of the gap, you know, the parenthesis, it's a gap, huh? And uh, as I say, in Jim Jordan's view, to speak about a gap, it's, just an, it's his variety of a parenthesis view. And, and the, uh, 
the anonymous and, and the dispensationalists are supposed to be at each other's uh, throat, but he, the, here he's adopting the, the same uh, her, her, hermeneutic. And as a matter of fact, that those two hermeneutics, uh, uh, extremely opposite to one another as the, they would seem to be, uh, actually share the same failing. Neither one knows how to handle the typology of the Old Testament, and uh, that leads to all kinds of other uh, problems for them. So these are, are, are some of the problems of the dispensationalist scheme, together with their whole mishandling of, uh, of uh, the language of Mashiach, Nagid, and parceling some of it off uh, to the Antichrist, uh, their, their total mistranslation and handling of the Higbir in, in, uh, in verse uh, 27a and, and so on. Um, in, in fact, in the, the, their interpretation of, of, of verse 27 uh, as something then that is uh, happening down at, at the 70th week, which is uh, beyond the church age as they propose it, that interpretation of verse 27, uh, of course, contradicts Jesus' interpretation of, uh, of the verse as having a, a fulfillment in, in, in 78 AD. Uh, the, the, as a matter of fact, uh, on a dispensational scheme, the whole prophecy ends on a totally negative uh, note, doesn't it? <coughs> their, their 70th week is uh, the, the, just this disastrous uh, uh, the great tribulation uh, thing. Now, you know, on, on our view, be, before the, the destruction of, of the old order, the new covenant has been established. And even though, in the, as a literary piece, as I said earlier, the, it, it closes with the thought of the fall of Jerusalem, <coughs> nevertheless included in the message of the 70 weeks is something that extends beyond uh, that fall uh, of Jerusalem and, and, and points to the consummation of yeah, and the, but the 70 weeks on a dispensationalist uh, scheme don't say anything about the new covenant order, any, anything beyond this 70th week. And within the 70th week, it's a, it ends with total disaster. So that there, so far as Daniel 9 is concerned, uh, you know that the, the passage is one of just of total gloom, and uh, they would have to find any message of hope or something beyond disaster somewhere else in the Bible and, and then tack it on, uh, but within their thing of the 70 weeks, it, it just ends on that completely negative uh, note. And uh, other points of, of uh, detail. Well, I think this is a good point to take our final break.